Okay, good afternoon. My name is Shante Russell. I'm the Vice President of Membership at AFSI International, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel, Disruptive by Design, Leveraging Artificial Intelligence in the Acquisition Process, Automating Processes, and Optimizing Resources. For those who may not know, AFSIA's emerging leaders are made up of our members who are aged 40 and under. But it's important to note that our panelists with us today are not here solely because of their age. They're here because of their expertise and experience in their field, and they just so happen to be under age 40. We appreciate your time and support for our panelists today. You are in for a great session, as our emerging leaders always have a great perspective on IT, AI, and cyber. To start, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Mr. Jim McPherson, a program manager at General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, Inc. Jim spent most of his career in aviation starting in 2004, serving our nation in the U.S. Navy on the USS Carl Vinson aircraft carrier. After leaving active duty, Jim bridged his experience from the military to the private sector as a site lead providing technical consultation services at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, overseas combat locations, and aircraft carriers at sea. Jim will introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion. So please join me in a warm AFSIA welcome for Jim McPherson. Thanks, everybody. Uh, before I introduce this esteemed panel here, I'll just kind of get into what we're going to be talking about. So if you want to leave, you can. I'm, I'm just kidding. So uh, what we're talking about today is artificial intelligence in the acquisition process. So we're really focusing in on automating processes and opti optimizing resources. So with the recent advancements in artificial intelligence and computational power, uh, an opportunity to optimize and protect supply chain and procurement processes, native language, advanced predictive analytics, cross-platform integration, and other automated support tools to help acquisition professionals without risk inform, with risk-informed decision-making. Data model resiliencies demand zero trust, security requirements, tailoring and integration to systems architecture, protecting AI automation. Effective cybersecurity measures and machine learning algorithms thwart data provisioning attacks and while providing readiness for AI achievement in its intended mission. So our panelists today will discuss industry and government collaboration for securing generative effective data sets and our panel attendees will hear about data-driven testing, training, and implementation of DOD applications. All right, so first here we have uh, Nicole Howard. She's a proposal manager at CAVU Consulting. So uh, Nicole is a proposal manager who specializes in DOD contracting, known for adeptly navigating complex regulations and requirements to generate competitive bids. Nicole leverages her knowledge on current DOD acquisition trends, techniques, and creatively employs technology to respond to requests for proposals. She is an active member of the Association for Proposal Management Professionals, which, her, which provides her with insight in adoption of AI and proposal management across multiple disciplines and markets. Nicole has supported the DOD and DUN throughout her career as an active duty, later reserve surface warfare officer, Nicole's deck plate and fleet experience at sea and ashore contribute to her understanding of the benefits and shortfalls of using AI and ML tools to, gener to generate uh, responses to RFIs using native program-specific language. At Caview Consulting, she uh, uh, a lean, rapidly growing, service-disabled, veteran-owned small business. Nicole is a one-man proposal shop, one-woman proposal shop, excuse me. To facilitate uh, efficient, successful proposal submission, Nicole uses generative AI and deterministic software. Nicole has researched, evaluated, selected, and implemented AI and ML tools to radically decrease RFP shred time, boost understanding of amendments, improve writing, uh, effectively generate responses, and maximize available time in short response cycles. Prior to joining CAVU, Nicole taught middle and elementary school in San Diego area. While teaching, she developed uh, grant management experience. Nicole's unique background as a military officer, educator, and grant manager have revolutionized CAVI's proposal management approach. Let's hear it for Nicole. Thank you. All right, just one second here. 
Next up, we have Christian Pereira. He is the founder and uh, CEO at Procurement Services AI, uh, where he is the, a, he and his team of AI experts have dedicated themselves to solving some of the most significant industry challenges commonly faced when trying to win government contracts. Through their groundbreaking work with generative AI, Christian and his team have been able to revolutionize how government contractors win business by saving them thousands of hours throughout the capture process and capture and proposal lifecycle by incorporating AI into their organizations. Procurement science mission is simple, help companies use AI to win government contracts, enabling them to bid smarter instead of harder. Prior to founding Procurement Sciences, he has held large uh, key roles at large government contracting tech companies, including managing director, uh, director of business strategy, senior uh, solutions architect, and software engineer. Christian is also a Marine Corps veteran with uh, the former rank of sergeant, where he led teams in multiple overseas deployments in the Middle East, holding a master's degree in innovation and entrepreneurship with a concentration of engineering, a bachelor's degree in business, as well as uh, a degree in computer science. Christian has a vast, wide range of skills and expertise in multiple disciplines. Let's hear it for Christian. All right, last but not least, we have Bala Savam. He's the CEO at Hop Algebra. Bala is a serial entrepreneur for his, uh, round, excuse me, serial entrepreneur renowned for his sex, success in tech space having served as the Chief Information Officer of the 3rd Marine Latour Regiment and SOCPAC as an officer in the Marine Corps where he brought innovation to the forefront of military operations. Currently, Bala works as an enterprise consultant addressing technical and operational challenges uh, in organiza organizations of all size. Bala has also started and become the CEO of Hop Algebra, a 501c6 organization focused on solving quantum issues. He is dedicated to connecting quantum experts across the United States. Bala's leadership reflects a commitment to pushing technolo technological boundaries and fostering collaboration in the ever-evolving landscape of innovation. Let's hear it for Bala. All right, now into the meat and potatoes of this uh, conference here. Uh, so Bala, it, right, you're out of the gate since we're already on you here. Could you explain to us the uh, difference between AI and machine learning? Yeah, so the difference between AI uh, and machine learning, with AI, think of it as your brain. It, it, it takes in explicit challenges and does ex explicitly does what you tell it to do. ML is made for implicit uh, usability, right? Like how your hands and limbs work. These will be your uh, machine learning tools, right? And so whenever you look at whatever you're trying to create, it's the brain itself with AI will explicitly take something in and then I mean, the machine learning tools will implicitly uh, do them. Okay, great. Uh, Christian, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so just a couple things to clarify, um, and that's great, but so like data science is like this big like circle. Within data science you have AI, within that you have ML, so they're all very related. Everything that I talk about today is gonna be related to like generative AI. So generative AI is a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, it falls into like the natural language processing category. It's pretty much what's all over the news. So like ChatGPT, Google Bard, that's like the subset that I'll really heavily focus on. And that is kind of like the revolutionary thing that popped up. AI itself's been around for 70 years. Generative AI has been around for a little bit longer as well, but ultimately within the last two years is where these big kind of pop-ups, like these big achievements happened. That's why you turn on your LinkedIn feed, the news, everyone's talking about ChatGPT and how it's really revolutionizing. So that's just what I wanted to add. Great, thank you. Nicole, do you have anything to add to this? Sure, I'll add on just about machine learning because it is still important. Um, think of it as pattern recognition, which as Bala said, it's something that your brain does anyways, right? So um, you feed a bunch of data into a program and it starts to do the pattern recognition on its own. So, you know, for instance, you could feed a machine learning program a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and eventually it should be able to differentiate between those two inputs and automatically identify what's a cat and what's a dog. Great, thank you. Uh, Nicole, can you give us a brief example of how this can be used for the acquisition process? Sure, so I'll start with machine learning since I just spoke to that. Um, and, and that's maybe not as applicable to the acquisition process. And you know, we'll talk more about generative AI. Um, but you can use uh, machine learning to do RFP and contract analysis. So you can have algorithms that can analyze just large volumes of 
contracts and procurement documents and extract some of that key information that you might be interested in, like the terms, the conditions, the pricing structures, um, and maybe help you streamline identifying those relevant contracts and RFPs. Um, a lot of us in the business development, uh, government contracting world, we also subscribe to um, certain websites that uh, do demand forecasting for us. So they're scraping large sets of data um, and analyzing historical procurement documents um, that can help you forecast either future demand for your business or when those RFPs are gonna be released. Um, that's a good use of that because it can analyze those patterns and trends of demand and also take into account things like continuing resolutions that may change the uh, release dates of things that are on your pipeline. Um, but that can help you better plan your activities as the RFP cycles and if you are in the product space, it can also help you um, optimize your inventory levels as well. So that's machine learning. Uh, as far as AI, um, there's some things you can do with intelligent automation. So um, what we'll speak to is RPA, uh, robotic process automation. And this is where I'm putting myself in the seat on the government contracting side. You know, they're taking, I'm assuming, an old procurement document to make a new one. And it's a lot to go through. Some of them are hundreds, if not thousands of pages long. Um, you can use robotic process automation um, to do some of those administrative tools, like scanning for dates. You know, how many RFPs have I seen come out that still don't list Juneteenth as a holiday, right? Scanning for FAR and DFAR clause updates. Um, so things like that, that sure, a human can do that, but it's nice to have a computer that can check that for you as well. Um, AI can also be used, you know, as Christian mentioned, you know, generative AI is really gonna be probably most of what we'll speak about for your content creation, your customization. Um, it can help you create that first draft of a proposal response. Um, I would say definitely don't do that on an open platform, um, but we'll get to some of those security concerns later. Um, another thing it can do is natural language processing. So there are AI systems that can understand and process human language and actually help your documents on whatever side of the contracting land you are be more readable and understandable to the end user. That's incredibly interesting. So I work uh, acquisitions so with, with Navair and these uh, proposals, RPs that come out, they're incredibly big, they're huge and they're a lot of work to get through and they're very expensive to work through. So any sort of uh, automation to help get to the bottom of that quickly I think would be helpful and I'd like to hear more about uh, software tools or automated support tools that help with acquisition. Uh, if you could cover stuff like that, that would, the advanced predictive analytics, cross-form platform integration, um, do you have any information on these tools that help with risk decision making? Sure, so that's a big question. So I, I apologize, I have a big answer for that one. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about advanced predictive analytics first. Um, so I talked a little bit about demand forecasting where there's websites and there's programs that'll scrape that data and they'll, they'll help predict when these things are going to be released um, that can help you plan your RFP cycles. Um, another thing it can do, which uh, maybe Christian can speak to more later, um, is competitor prediction. So there's um, advanced predictive analytic programs um, that can predict who would be your potential competitors in these um, bid and proposal cycles. And they base that on historical data, uh, past contracts, and some other relevant factors. Um, so using that as a proposal manager, I can do some competitive analysis that can help me identify weaknesses in a competitor that I can then ghost in my proposal um, and determine what would be a competitive price to win. Um, it also can do some market analysis for you and your business where you can look at your own past performance, compare it to that contract and identify gaps for you, which if you do that early enough can help you um, build your team. You know, maybe that's a, a topic that where you bring in a teaming partner to address that weakness in your business so that you have a more competitive bid. Um, so that's advanced predictive analytics. I believe the next thing you asked me about was cross-platform integration. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna define that first. Um, and so that's the process of connecting and combining different software applications, um, systems or platforms. And ideally, ideally, those work together seamlessly. 
um, regardless of whatever operating environment or underlying technologies there. Um, I am not a technician, so just some things that I think about when I'm evaluating tools and thinking about cross-platform integration. Um, you know, are you on commercial cloud or are you on a GCC high environment? Because that's gonna affect some of the things that you're able to choose and deploy. Um, what software are you already using for word processing and graphic design? And, and can this product that you're looking at integrate with what you're already using? Or are you going to deploy something that's going to cause you to have to change your entire environment? And is that really worth it? Um, is the data that's going into it manually or automatically synchronizing with what you already have in your system? There's pros and cons to each of those. Um, is it going to be useful or is it going to automate workflows? Um, is it uh, scalable and flexible to whatever future iterations of your system that you have? Um, the biggest thing I think with cross-platform integration is making sure that the security tools all align. Um, and with that, you know, are you able to air gap certain things so that your financial, your personnel, your HR data is not feeding into this AI system? So that's cross-platform integration. As far as risk-informed decision-making, there's kind of two different things there. Um, as far as generative AI, um, goes, that's actually, it's a mathematical model. So it's using probability to predict what word comes next. For making risk informed decisions, I would be really careful with that one. But what it is good at is if you don't have a lot of time and you get this 500 page RFP, um, it can summarize large amounts of text or data um, that you could then narrow down into a much more digestible format and have a very quick discussion about that may be a very I easy bid or no bid decision for you. Um, the other thing that you can use for risk-informed decision making is deterministic software and deterministic software gives you the same type of response every time. Generative AI will not do that. Um, that can do things like flag keywords that you know, maybe something that you're considering in your process, like FAR and DFAR clauses, um, a favorite one in the San Diego market being the Service Contract Act wages. Um, you know, it is a, a risk, right, for businesses to sometimes take that on, and so that can inform some of your decision making there. That's great. Uh, Christian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so just a couple things. Um, so why generative AI is so powerful is going back to like natural language processing. Not to go like super, super like technical into it, but natural language processing, like these generative AI models, the way you use them is the same way you would talk to a coworker. So just like you would talk to a coworker and give them a task is the same way you talk from these AI models. So it makes it very easy for anyone to kind of adopt in their day to days. Within natural language processing, the two parts that are very powerful is natural language understanding and then natural language generation. So NLU, which is natural language understanding, is the AI can understand huge amounts of text just like a human would. So a human, it might take them you know, a couple hours to read through 500 pages. The AI can do it in less than a second, but have that same kind of understanding level as if a human read it 50 times. And then natural language generation is, after it understands, it's generating back text, code, images, anything to you ultimately that you might need for whatever sort of task you're doing. And that combination makes it extremely powerful kind of makes it leapfrog a lot of like traditional software and uh, even like AI and ML. As far as tools, I would say the biggest thing, we work with a lot of government contractors, it's uh, don't use public tools. If you're working, do not feed your proposals, any of your content through ChatGPT. I'm hoping that everyone knows this by now, but ChatGPT, these public tools, the way they get their data flywheel and they get their competitive advantage is by everything you put in there, they take it and they train their future models. Um, something that's good to kind of note is we we're talking about machine learning. Large language models are what power these generative AI like applications. They're all stateless. And what stateless means is they don't actually continue to learn. So when you have like ChatGPT, if you feed all your company data in there and you realize tomorrow that it just took that data, no one else is going to know until the next model comes out. So in six months, that's where your company is going to be in trouble because now the smart AI kind of like developers, they can prompt inject it very quickly and it starts spitting out all of your strategic information, and that's where a lot of people don't realize that they're not learning in real time, they learn delayed, and they take all your data, stick it in a separate database, and then use that for that future data flywheel. All right, thanks. Uh, Bala, this one's for you. If there are any differences in how contractors or federal agencies uh, or 
like the DoD view acquisition AI. Do you have anything to share about how these things differ? Yeah, so I'll give actual a, a real use case that's happening right now. So last week at the, well, it was really last last month, but last week when we were at the Bravo Hackathon in Keen Edge, uh, in Hawaii, um, we had realized that hey, that sensing data that we're getting from our our predictive maintenance cycles are really bad. Like it's, I mean, it was a 303 column sensing data file that we had to like kind of squish down to around 62 columns. Which, if you're a regular human being, that's It'll take, a, it'll take a hot minute to do that, right? And the reason why that's important is if you're the commander and you're trying to s send your vehicles out to an advanced naval base, uh, at, the way it works right now is you're gonna send the vehicle out there and then if something breaks on that vehicle, you're sending it back. That's not very efficient, it's not gonna work because we, we don't have those types of ships or that kind of time to move those vehicles in and out. So that com the commander needs to understand what's happening in those vehicles and what, and what that parent-child parent-child relationship looks like with that vehicle. What parts are degraded, which, what parts are deadline, what parts are you know, operational, and, and, the, and, the, and, and overall readiness of that vehicle, and how we're gonna ship those parts uh, to the various uh, advanced bases across, across the Indo-Pacific, right? Now, when we, built, when we were building out the entire large language model and, and, and neural network to predict those things, and provide those resources to the commander to make those commanding uh, those commander decisions, right? There's a lot of things that go into, the, into that, right? We left the Bravo Hackathon with all of the capabilities necessary, maybe not to scale, but that's where you go to industry to try to get those, those products from industry to actually enhance those and scale it to an enterprise level down to the tactical edge. And w the issue there and what's happening now is Logcom, uh, the director of Logcom, uh, Craig Clemens, is, a, is a having to put a, 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 an UNS or a DUNS, which is like urgent needs statements and a deliberate urgent needs statements up. He just told me, like, right before we got on this panel, that's, that's going to suck because I just got back from Hawaii and now I got to do this to go actually do the thing that I want to do to make my job a lot easier. So he's going to take that and it's going to take about a couple months for him to run that process up. So when you look at it from both ways, if if the higher level echelons get the Dion's and uns from both sides saying, hey, this is an urgent need capability that needs to happen, and it works faster, and we, and we as a human being don't need to spend the time writing those paperwork, setting it up, tracking it, and tracing it up and down that chain, I think that'll save a lot of time for us to get the capabilities that we need over in the Pacific. Because when we tried that at third MLR, uh, there's still Dion's still at DCI and L and DCI that, we haven't, that haven't been touched yet. Uh, in fact, there was a DUNS to make McTissa and S get STRL status, and that happened like a couple weeks ago, and that was sent in like five years ago. So, speeding up that cycle, I think, will help out, and that's that's the difference between how both sides, both industry and, and DOD, can take advantage of that. Great, thanks, uh, Christian. Over to you. What are some of the key advancements in AI that have significant implications for the acquisition process? Yeah, so again, just to like clarify, generative AI is what I'm going to talk about. So lots of advancements are always taking place, like AI, machine learning. But generative AI specifically, I keep saying the word like leapfrogging technology. Um, it very much is. So lots of legacy software applications, even legacy ways of using you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, pretty much got obsolete over the last year. Very, very quickly disrupted. Um, you're going to see across the board, just about every tool is going to try to adopt AI, generative AI, very quickly. Because if they don't, they're going to get leapfrogged and ultimately become obsolete. As far as like the advancements, so just to kind of touch on how fast generative AI is moving right now. About one year ago, when ChatGPT came out, uh, you could feed in about two pages of text. So that means two pages of text the AI could understand instantly. Today, it's about 500 pages of text. So within the last year, it's gone up significantly vertical where that's where now you can feed in a 500 page proposal and within you know, five minutes it spits out a 500 page response very, very quickly. Uh, so ultimately they call those context windows. So they keep developing ways to have these AIs have longer memories, longer context windows. The longer they get, it allows the AI to focus without kind of forgetting halfway through those conversations. Uh, ultimately the way it, it analyzes, it can do both like structured and unstructured data. So structured data is like a database. So everyone's familiar with like a SQL database. Those AIs, they can go in there, they can analyze all the information in a SQL database, but unstructured data is the more unique one, and that's just dumping any sort of data on it and the AI can instantly understand it. Doesn't matter about like formatting, spelling, if it's a PowerPoint, Excel, Word file, you scan a document in, it's able to take that instantly, analyze it, and then ultimately spit out the outputs that you're looking for. 
So that's probably the, the biggest thing is how fast these AIs are building their memories and how much information they can take in at once and then spit back out to you. Wow, okay, uh, great, thank you. Nicole, do you have anything to add? I mean, the only thing that I would add on to that, you, you know, what you've talked about, it all just comes down to time, right? And if we can reduce the amount of time um, that we're spending on things and be able to create higher quality proposals, it's gonna give the government better options. Um, the other thing, thinking about it from the government side, uh, if you can reduce the number of amendments that are coming out, your acquisition cycle is going to be a lot shorter. So these tools can help. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bala, can you talk about the evolution of AI and what recent advancements in AI have significantly contributed to this rapid evolution? Uh, yeah, so I'll go to what Google's doing over, over with DeepMind, right? I think I, back in 2014, I used a lot of like their deep reinforcement learning uh, uh, Open source, open source tools that allowed me to, uh, like, it's going to sound a little scary, but we used a lot of the tools back then to de detect uh, buying trends from social media use to big box retail apps. And we were taking all that data that we can say, hey, we can, down to near 99% accuracy, we can get exactly what you're going to look at in Instagram, and then we can say what you're going to buy on Amazon. Um, Almost, almost immediately, and we can also tell the, the trends you'll take when you go to Walmart uh, after going on social media. What you're going to buy in what order, and we were selling that data back then. And then, now looking back 11 years later, when you look at the advancements that AI has has come from, not only can it, it detect that now with generative AI, the having reinforcement learning more with the large language models and reinfor deep reinforcement learning, we're getting very, very close to we're kind of getting the human out of the loop, where the, the brain and the, the MLs are now working so intuitively together that technology, it, like I heard earlier today, technology is easy, people are hard. If we take the people out, technology will be very, very easy to continuously uh, integrate and, and, uh, and iterate. And so I think that, that for me is, is, it has been the advancement. And when you look at when we get into quantum computing or qu quantum research, uh, what we're working on at UTD and, and SMU is looking at one getting everything down to all our computers down to one Kelvin, right? Getting it down to near near impossible uh, is a little bit hard, but once we got it down to near, once we got it down to one Kelvin, we were able to have a almost a sentient being with, with a lot of the AI tools we had built from the AI labs um, kind of speak to us until it, obviously it blew up and we, when it got back to 35 Kelvin. But from that time frame, that's kind of scary that you can have a full on conversation and it actually understanding and being aware of where it's at. Can I add one more thing to that? Quick? Absolutely, yeah, go ahead. So I think you, you have a really good point, which wanted me to throw something in. So right now we're very much in like an AI co-pilot phase, right? That's all you hear is co-pilot, where the human is in the driver's seat and the AI is your co-pilot. That is gonna change very quickly. I think that people don't realize how fast that's coming, but probably within the next like six to like 18 months, we're gonna see that shift where the AI goes into the driver's seat and the human is more of the co-pilot. Doesn't mean the human's out, but it means the human's gating factor as far as moving the AI through its kind of life cycle. And that's what he was mentioning when he says like sentient, which is like AGI. AGI is a big thing that people pop up right now and it's very much a buzzword, but they're also getting very, very close to it. It's very quiet as far as like the research behind it, but it is gonna come and there is gonna be another big shift where you know, last year ChatGPT came out very powerful, but it is very much a co-pilot. But when that shifts again, it's gonna be a whole nother world of applications and kind of how everyone operates. Great, thank you. Uh, Balak, in what ways uh, has the convergence of AI with other technologies, how, how's that convergence happen with things like blockchain or quantum computing, and how's that impact its evolution? Yeah, so I j as I just mentioned, right, when. We uh, earlier, so adding to what I, I just said, with the with the thought of quantum computing, right? When when everyone when we say quantum computing, and how that differs from regular computing, right now a regular computer can do ones or zeros. A quantum computer one and a zero. So when you look at how physics works, technically the computer can't tell can't just tell you what's happening on this world. It can tell you what's happening on a whole another spectrum in another galaxy, another universe and bring that to you almost in real time, faster than you could actually think about what you ate for breakfast, right? And so when you look at it that way, and you take all the large language models that we have, and now this quantum computer has all access to that language models, once it takes it in, uh, it, 
Like there's nothing we can do about it, right? And then when you, when you go into quantum entanglement and now those two computers are now talking, uh, two, two supercomputers are better than, well, obviously better than one, but better than any human on this planet. I think that's, that's what's scary is the, the development and the innovation of, the, of those technologies can actually grow very, very fast, very, very quickly. Great, thank you. Um, Christian, what are our uh, current technical limitations of using AI uh, in the acquisition process? Uh, so the, probably the biggest problem is gonna be like data security and privacy. So like we don't sell to the government because of that. The regulations, the compliance, the headache that goes into it, that's gonna be the biggest issue, which is getting it into the hands of the government. The other big thing is, as I mentioned, like how fast AI is advancing right now, you gotta realize that you know, the acquisition process is slow. So by the time it gets through, it gets developed, it gets in the hands of the government, ultimately AI is already gonna shift, you know, five steps to the right, and they're already gonna be behind again. So I think that that's a really major issue, which is we need to find a way where industry can work better with the government, keep you guys kind of building very quickly, um, not just using the word like agile as like a buzzword in your proposal responses, but like a real agile software development team, which is like being able to pivot, iterate very quickly and continue to keep, you know, that end user up to date as far as all the advancements that take place. Comes back to like the AGI stuff, and I'm sure I'll get some flack after this for it, but uh, ultimately the way when AGI hits, it's going to hit very, very quickly and it's going to be like an overnight thing that when it does get released, people are gonna grab it and people are gonna start to build with it. And if the government doesn't have the ability to adopt that into their day-to-day -day flows very quickly, they're gonna be in a very bad spot, so. Great, Nicole, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, so just as far as limitations, when I think um, from my side as a proposal manager in the acquisition process, um, the first is, you know, the language model that these are built on may not actually be academic or professional enough for the type of writing that you're doing. Um, if there's nothing else that you take away from this panel, it's that, you know, please do not ever copy and paste anything out of an AI model. You know, it still needs to be read by a human, checked by a human, and verified by a human. Um, I've seen some models that are, are more tailored, um, and so they use what's called retrieval augmented uh, generation. And so essentially what that does is uh, it's a using an LLM, but it is proprietary to your network, right? It's a paid, they're usually very expensive. Um, but when Christian mentioned that unstructured data, right? That 85% of your data that's on your networks right now, that's in PDFs, that's in your PowerPoints, that's in your monthly status reports, it can take that and that language model is now training on your data and can write in your voice with your company's information. Um, so the, I guess the limitation there is really that it is expensive. And if you're um, a small business or you're a startup that's trying to implement one of those tools, it is going to be um, a large investment. Um, with that though, you also have to be really deliberate if you're using something like that on the data that you're inputting to train that model. Um, and one thing I haven't seen, and maybe one of you two can speak to it, I've asked this question before and I've not gotten a good answer. Uh, is how do you untrain that language model? So when I put in a proposal, I can usually use maximum five years of past performance data. Well, if I'm uploading a bunch of stuff and now it's aged and it's five years and one day old and I can't use it anymore, how do I get that out of the language model? And can I do that? And can I do it well? Yeah, so you can't. Uh, I can tell you like the approach that we took and it's from like a lot of trial and error is we realize that training a model from the ground up is a losing battle because you're fighting Microsoft, you're fighting AWS, these people who have like these Goliaths of like AI research teams. So uh, you brought up the keyword, which is RAG, so retrieval augmented generation. It's also called like semantic searching. The benefit of using like a RAG based algorithm is ultimately it's not training on that information. All it has is it takes the information, it ingests it and it puts it into what's called a vector database or a vector store and it pulls from the vector store to actually build its answers. So with like a RAG model, let's say you upload a losing proposal that you don't want to use, it's as simple as just deleting it and it comes out of the vector store. Versus if you do train a model from the ground up and you train it on bad data, then you are stuck with that model that's in there and there's ways around it, but it's very difficult to keep that like data segregated off to the side. So that's what we've learned is paying these huge amounts of money to try to train a model for your company from the ground up is a very bad idea. Uh, the other reason it's a bad idea is because of how fast AI is moving. So if you train a model today 
and you get it to a certain benchmark, in six months you could have a million dollar paperweight that you're sitting on versus if you build off of like the Microsoft or the Google or I'm not playing any sides here, but if you build off their ecosystem, you can stay at the tip of the spear as far as leveraging all the investment they're putting there as these new models continue to come out and then have applications that are built on top of them using like RAG algorithms and semantic searching algorithms. Great, thanks. Christian, what are some key regulatory and compliance considerations when implementing AI and government acquisition? I think you touched on this a bit, but can you expand a bit? Yeah, so, and this is the reason why like a lot of companies don't try to sell to the government, um, is ultimately you have like, like CUI restrictions, you have like FedRAMP and NIST and all the headaches of like CMMC and for like a startup, right, that's where a lot of your innovation is, is like these young software developers, AI researchers that like thrive on it, but when they run into like selling to the government, I think they're enticed by it, it's interesting, but they see all those data restrictions, everything they need to go through to actually sell, and they instantly just say, you know what, I'd rather just sell to the commercial sector is what, or instead. So I think that's the, maybe the biggest thing is, how do you take like these innovative startups and find a way to like bridge them to allow them to work with the government very easily so that they can be more agile, keeping them up to date with all like the latest advancements? Nicole, can you uh, expand on that, please? Sure, so, I mean, in a lot of ways, the laws and the regulations, they haven't caught up with the technology. And we've seen this problem happen before, and I, I realize I'm dating myself when I think back to like nuking my parents' computer in the early 2000s of Metallica v Napster, right? So that was revolutionary technology. It didn't go away right away. It did profoundly change the way that we listen to music, right? We don't buy CDs anymore. Um, but, you know, we are seeing the New York Times sue these open AI platforms. Um, we're seeing legislation being drafted at the same time as those legal battles are being fought. Um, we don't really know what's going to happen, right? But they're applying, at least in the legal system, existing case law and existing legislation in new ways. So I would say there are laws that already exist. There are regulations, as Christian mentioned, a bunch of them, that already exist. Um, you know, anything relating to the data privacy and security, uh, bias uh, as far as fairness and non-discrimination and cybersecurity, those all still apply. Those are not going to change and they're not going to go away. Um, uh, we just saw in October an executive order come out um, working to establish a comprehensive framework, you know, essentially saying we know AI is not going to go away, but we need to develop this responsibly and make sure that it's actually beneficial to society and, and mitigate those risks and challenges. Um, so that's all I would add there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Nicole, can you share some, ex some specific examples of how organizations can leverage AI tools to gain a competitive marketplace advantage sure. and streamline their processes? Yeah. So I, this is my favorite thing to talk about because uh, as a proposal manager and talking to others, you know, it, it is a rough job and doing government contracting is a rough business sometimes. And um, you work a lot of nights and weekends and that's, you know, not ideal for the health of a business, right? Um, so to me, the biggest factor is, is really time. And, and that's how I leverage having more time that gives me an edge and that gives me an advantage. Um, if I have more time, uh, heaven forbid, I'd be more relaxed and more productive, but it is possible. Um, I can use that time either to put in more prime bids um, or I can put in higher quality bids. Um, those tools can help me identify um, gaps and, and add strengths to my proposals um, to resolve weaknesses. Um, as I mentioned before, I can do that in the capture phase and identify teaming partners that help bolster my P-Win. Um, and in the uh, proposal phase, I can actually use that to help make sure that I'm compliant with the instructions in that RFP. Um, so one example of something that gives me a competitive edge is I use a tool, and I'm not going to tell you what it is unless someone wants to sponsor me. Um, but uh, it allows me to shred uh, RFPs and amendments and compare them. And that has saved me literal weeks of time. Um, a couple things I can do with that. So I know what's on my pipeline. I can actually start my proposal process before that comes out on the old acquisition, right? I'll start my kickoff brief, I'll start my outline, I'll start gathering content. When that RFP drops, all I have to do is run it through the software and compare how it looked to the old one and maybe make some changes. And I can usually use about 80% of what I've come up with already. Um, Another thing that it allows me to do is when those amendments do come out, 
it actually takes me longer to download the documents from SAM.gov or from Seaport than it does for me to upload, shred, compare, and then send instructions out to my subcontractors and to the other people on my proposal team. I can usually get that information out to them and how it affects them in under an hour. That's something that wouldn't be possible for me to do before at all. Um, uh, I can do data manipulation, so it can add rows or columns to data, so I can take things and I can move them into formats that are more user-friendly um, for me. Um, you know, putting things into Excel, sometimes just putting it in a different format, it makes it a little bit more readable, manipulatable, and uh, usable. Um, as far as generative AI, um, I have used that to unstick writer's block at times. Um, there's also ways you can take uh, content from your SMEs, from your technicians, your engineers, um, and take that and put it into a, a more digestible format. Um, when we think about proposals, like yes, they have to be technical, yes, they have to be compliant, but it is also a sales document, and the person on the other end of it might not be an engineer, and they might not be a technician, and they need it at a level that they can understand in order for you to be considered. Um, Another thing that one of the tools I use does it, is it'll scan for readability and compliance, which is something that, that I'm not able to do. And those are also things that are really not well done by a human. And so that's something I would consider if you're looking at these tools as well. Like, is this a process that we're not doing? Is it something we're doing and we're not doing it well? And then is this meaningful work for a human? Like, is it meaningful work for a human to sit and copy and paste things into an Excel document? I don't really think so, but. Thanks, Christian. Do you have uh, some examples as well? Yeah, I think the best way to look at it is it's definitely like streamlining. So taking things that used to do like take you a week, now you can do it in minutes. So that's probably like the biggest. Uh, it really comes down to becoming like a force multiplier where we work with like big SIs all the way down to like small, mid-sized businesses. They all use it for something different. Uh, the big companies, 100%, it's, you know, three of them going after multi-billion dollar contracts and who can, you know, go in there and ensure that it's compliant, it's the best kind of proposal, has differentiators in it, versus, you know, the small, mid-sized businesses who can't afford these big capture proposal teams, they use it as a force multiplier where it comes in, the AI is going to help them add, you know, 8x efficiency to whatever they're working on, crank out more proposals, take more shots on target, and ultimately land more deals. Um, some more unique ways, there's some pretty interesting use cases out there as far as like how you can use AI for like a real like differentiation as far as like competitive advantage. One is like taking the AI, having it analyze your proposal and identifying ways like going in there and doing like uh, simulations as far as how can you, you know, rewrite it, how can you highlight more like differentiation, like getting the AI to actually brainstorm for you so it develops ways that when it hits the government, it's going to be, you know, that like aha moment that this company has like a very differentiated solution compared to everyone else who has more of a canned solution. So there's a lot of strategic, very interesting ways you can use it. Great, thanks. Uh, Nicole, you touched on this a bit, but can you share with us uh, any case studies that where AI led to significant cost savings or efficiency gains? Um, sure, so I, I went and I looked and I pulled a few, so I'll just say, if you are considering uh, any of these tools, Go look at their websites. They all have case studies there, and I highly recommend that you read as many as you can, you know, related to your business, not related to your business, so you understand um, what they do. Um, so I'll just share my own. If you've worked with me, you know I love a, a prolific capabilities matrix, um, and those are documents that drive our teaming agreements um, and how we're going to assign work share and tasking in the proposal cycle. Um, in the past, I, you know, used to copy and paste things into an Excel document and it came out pretty ugly and unusable and both for the person that had to complete it and then for me on the other end to have to compile all this information and figure out what we were gonna do with it. Um, I can now make one in under 20% of the time and it, it looks nicer and it's more user friendly for everybody. Um, I went and uh, looked for a couple companies that work in the, the government contracting space. Um, the first one I'll talk about is a company called Government Acquisitions, and they're a value-added reseller out of Ohio. Now, the two companies I'm going to speak about, I have no relationship with. Like, they're just examples that I found that I thought would be useful. Um, but they have over 30 years in the federal space, and they're on some really large GWACs. Um, so things like NASA Soup, they're on Department of State, DHS, and they're on Seaport. So they're 
all over the place. Um, they're a huge organization and they do tons of business. And you would think, well, wow, their capture and BD and proposal team must be huge. It's four people. Um, so they're a very lean team with big responsibilities um, and they use um, a program that was deterministic with some natural language processing um, to automate, and this is where they assess, they wanted to automate those manual steps um, and that's what they were able to do. So they're able to ensure compliance, do some contract uh, concept tracking, um, and make these value propositions in their proposals um, as well as faster bid and no bid decisions. Um, because it's helping them make those large amounts of data digestible. Um, so for them, time saving was really the main benefit um, and allowed them to narrow their BD and capture team's focus to things that they knew they had a good chance at winning. And it also helped focus their salespeople um, to help them provide better customer service. Um, the other one that I found was uh, Microsoft uh, implemented a ge generative uh, option for proposal development last year. It saved them $4.2 million, which maybe for a company like Microsoft doesn't seem like a lot, but for a company like mine, that's a lot. Um, so they found that it increased their efficiency in their proposal management. They found that it w made it easier collaboration because everything was hosted in one workspace. Um, and that it saved their sales team time that they were now able to spend with their customers. Um, getting to your point of being a differentiated product and being able to make that sale, make that argument, create a case for change for that customer, which is ultimately what we're trying to do when we submit a proposal. Um, they cited a report that said employees spend like 20% of their time trying to find information from other places, whether that's in a shared drive somewhere, God forbid, on someone's desktop or you know, from a subject matter expert, but that having all that in this generative program allowed their sales and proposal teams to have access readily to pre-approved content, and they were able to then spend more time with their customers showing how their solutions address their needs. Great, thanks. Um, over to Bala, what are the key factors in considering the cost-benefit analysis uh, when, when determining whether, uh, when using an AI implementation in the acquisition process? Yeah, I, I think one way is actually just evaluating exactly what we're, what we're procuring. Uh, sometimes it doesn't need to take $50 million to make something that should normally usually cost $100,000. And I, I think if we work smaller with a lot of the smaller companies that are out there and actually sifting through a lot of the, the, smaller, the small businesses, utilizing SIBRs and, and contract vehicles uh, such as that, we can actually get a lot, a lot of stuff done. I think what, what was really cool with the, when, we, when I was at SOCPAC is they, we worked a lot with the various small businesses that we tooled together with like, you know, obviously the cloud service providers, and we were able to get stuff done really, really quickly by, by just spitting out IATTs and ATOs left and right. Um, and then on top of that, like I said, technology is easy, uh, people are hard. So the more people we can kind of get out of that mix and just kind of make it a more streamlined, streamlined process, I think will help uh, reduce costs a little bit on when we, when we go through the acquisition cycle. Great, uh, I got another one for you. How can the data sets used in AI algorithms be protected against poisoning attacks? Are there any common cybersecurity measures in place to protect them against these threats? Yeah, so that could just be a whole panel on itself, but uh, so data poisoning is essentially just an uh, influx of data that's coming in that mainly is an anomaly that you shouldn't be having in your data sets, right? And how you detect, how we can detect that is having the having uh, basic basic access controls uh, implemented with zero trust strategies and stuff like that, and also training the model to detect anomalies by injecting it kind of like a um, kind of kind of like a vaccine, right? You want it to test it out by shift, by giving it certain. Uh, anomalies in the training models and saying, hey, every time you see this, this is, uh, this is considered data poisoning and essentially tagging that data. Um, and then over time, the, 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 the AI ML models will, will pick that up. Great, thanks. All right, well, we have uh, 10 minutes left here on stage before we get kicked off. Uh, thank you guys for sharing all that information. And I think now we can take some questions from the crowd. I think there's a microphone right there behind you. So with the uh, increase in 
uh, consumer awareness about privacy and what they're putting online in their data, and also the advent of companies like the New York Times and obviously these social media companies and stuff uh, with the vast amount of data that they have and they know it's worth something. Do you think we'll see a downturn in the quality of that data if they can't get it for free? Do you think the big players will end up paying for it um, if they're asked to pay for it? Uh, what do you guys think? I mean, yeah, data is the new gold, so I think anytime you have like a unique data set, people are always going to pay for it. Um, not to get myself in trouble, and I'm going to quote like Elon Musk here, but all these large language models, they're trained on copyrighted data. So if they're telling you it's not, it's a lie. Um, he pretty much came out and put it very clearly that they're scraping 40% of the entire historical information from the internet, taking it and training these large language models, and then obviously taking your data, coming back to like ChatGPT and that flywheel, which is every time you put data in there, they're training their models further and further on it. So now where you can get yourself in trouble is like trying to train your own model, right? You are, you could be sued for copyright infringement. Now these big companies like, you know, the Microsoft, they say if you use our models, we'll defend you, right? And that's because they have hundreds of millions of dollars to put lawyers out there. And like right now, New York Times is trying to sue OpenAI. And you know, OpenAI has billion dollar investors that are defending them and they're just pushing it down the road so far that when it does come up, it's, you know, it's gonna come to the day of, or the light of day, which is, yeah, these models were trained on copyrighted data and now copyrighted data infringements, like that whole law needs to be rewritten, so. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, the World Wide Web is an open source tool that no one can govern. So you type in a, uh, a like an address, and you go there, your data can still get tracked. In fact, they banned what I was doing, obviously three years ago, after I sold my company, and uh, then another company said, well, we're just gonna do it for Shopify stores on the internet. So they, they can do that, and guess what, no one can do anything about it, so that data will always be tracked and be collected, unless you stop using the internet. I would be interested to see if they are gonna pay for the data, how much they're going to pay for it. Um, and if that's actually gonna lead to some consolidation, whether that's you know, on the data owner side, are they now going to say, well, you know, we'll give it to you, but we're gonna acquire your company in doing that. Yeah, I think that you know, the large language models that are open are amazing. I, I'm not sure what the future for them is. I would not be surprised if there's more of a move to these proprietary data sets and proprietary language models that are not uh, freely accessible to everybody. All right, thanks. Sir? Hello. Uh, thank you for today, it's been very informative. Uh, Troy Gunter, I'm a contracting officer for NAV War, and the question I've got, you, you've spoken about this in terms of contractors' proposals and those types of things. Are you seeing any government agencies uh, using AI. So for instance, prior to the RFP process, there are mounds of, of data and paperwork that we go through, acquisition strategies, all of those things that we require approval for. And what I see is an acquisition workforce that's not familiar with specific formats. They understand what they want, they can generate a PowerPoint chart, but there, it takes a lot of time and effort for them to turn it into an acquisition document that's useful for me in terms of releasing an RFP. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm interested in it, is because I think there's a lot of time that could be saved from a generative AI standpoint, from an engineer who understands what they want to turn it into a document that I need as a contracting officer to put in an RFP. So are you seeing anything like that in the government, even up to proposal evaluations, et cetera? I think it's happening unofficially, um, and I'm not sure that I could tell you or would know like what agencies are doing it. Um, I, I would think on an individual level, there's probably some people that are using that for help writing statements of work and things like that. Um, as far as implementing it in the federal space on the, on the government side, I would say, uh, and I don't know this person, but I follow him on LinkedIn. His name is Chris Kraft, and he works for FEMA. And every week he publishes something where he consolidates everything that's happening with AI, both from the federal side, the state and local education market, and then um, the international market as well. Um, that would be someone that I would follow that I think would have more insight into that. Um, and I, I don't know if you have experience yeah. with that, Bala. Yeah, so NASA. Uh, so it's an, specifically the uh, human works division over at NASA, right? So they work on like enhanced uh, human performance. Uh, Cody Burkhart, their director, has, is using certain AI models and 
for the RFP process so he can like take in, essentially what he's doing, he's getting a lot of uh, T, uh, TIM meetings, technical interchange meetings with a lot of these companies to brief and do all these things with the preface that he is doing that and he is collecting all that data and then with the ones that come back to him as the, the most likely to succeed in what he's trying to do, he'll go and that's how he slims, it, slims that process down. So as we go, keep moving, the technical interchange meetings go from 500 to like 10 in like a matter of months. Right, and by the time he gets down to three, he knows exactly the three, three or five things that he needs in that in that body suit that we're going to have to utilize in future uh, space travel. I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. Okay. I think if you go to the CDA, like CDAO, I think it's like a government website. I have no affiliation, but I do believe there are some tools out there for like acquisition offices to actually use, uh, like basic chatbots. I haven't seen like evaluation tools yet, which is. Hopefully, like these system integrators are taking notes because if we're helping you respond to more proposals, now your teams need to review more proposals and you just don't have the bandwidth. So there's definitely like a huge gap right now where the government needs these types of tools, not to select the winning proposal, that's a good way to get like protested, but at least down select, help you identify ones that are, you know, throwaways, that aren't readable, that have bad compliance in it. So I do think that over like the next six months to like, you know, 12 months, you will see a lot more of these system integrators like picking up on that and like catering to that need. Hopefully they're not charging you a ton of money. And I think this is something like Bala mentioned is, like I hate to break it, like it doesn't cost that much money to develop a system like that. Like a couple weeks and like the right like AI engineers, you could have a system for like under 50,000. Great, thank you very much. We have a few more minutes. Any other questions from the crowd? All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you guys' time and attention. Uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, your expertise has been very insightful, so thank you very much.